sweat and splinters Forest elders breathe their last I'll bring them for your supper Every piece of wood I bring Hey y'all, welcome to the Ground Shots podcast, a podcast that explores our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling. This episode of the podcast features a conversation with Marissa Prococo out of Barnardsville, North Carolina. Marissa is an avid fermentation enthusiast who has spent the last 10 years exploring community in the wilds, as well as living deeply with various fermented cultures and local plants and learning how it all comes together. Traveling through the wild places of Tennessee, Florida, the Southwest, California, Colorado, Arizona, Utah, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii, and most everywhere in between with her four amazingly adventurous children, Marissa has gathered cultures from far and wide. Deeply rooted in the Earth Skills movement and committed to co-creating a new culture within which we, our children, and all beings thrive, they are now nesting in Barnardsville, North Carolina. She's also now the director of the Firefly Gathering, one of the biggest primitive skills gatherings in the country and located in the Southeast. In this conversation with Marissa, we talk about rural Appalachia dynamics and gentrification in a valley outside of a hip city, Asheville, North Carolina. We speak to some stories of Marissa's moving from the Bay Area in California to the rural South in the early 2000s, which was initially a very big culture shock We talk about shifting from years of nomadicism to mainly tending one small place in community. We speak to some of Marissa's childhood experiences in California with chemically bonded parents and plant-loving grandparents. We talk about farming in wet climates versus arid climates. We talk about tending tropical plants in a subtropical four-season place and pushing the edge of what is possible during rapid climate change. We talk about the perspective gained from travel and having an awareness of plants in those places. We talk about Marissa's time in the Gila wilderness doing walks and we geek on plants we both have found there. We talk about the pros and cons of isolation, living in wilderness areas, codependency, addiction, and depression wrapped up in idealism, how we can contribute to society. We talk about what is the Firefly Gathering, a land skills gathering in the South, and what it's doing now, and how Marissa is directing this gathering. We talk about Marissa's mead brewing practice on the road over the years, capturing place through brewing plants. And lastly, we talk about how facing the immediacy of death changes perspective. During this conversation in the beginning, we had a little bit of noise from the highway pick up on my field recorder, but by halfway, that definitely slows down and you hear a lot more bugs and uh, critters from from the field. So yeah, I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Marissa. And don't forget that this podcast is primarily funded by Patreon and any support and subscription on there helps us out a whole lot. So patreon.com slash of sedge and salt is the way to get there. Happy listening, y'all. Maybe we could start with uh, sharing where we are right now, um, your beautiful little spot in the world that you tend, and then we'll go from there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah so we're in Barnardsville, or is this officially Dillingham? This is Barnardsville. Barnardsville. Yeah, Barnardsville starts, like, right downtown. Cool. So I'm, I'm just in Barnardsville. Apparently, real Barnardsville is out in the haulers out there more. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. The was... old Barnardsville, or... Yeah. Yeah, like the Dillinghams take it really seriously. What is the official Um, Barnardsville? (laughs) I don't know. It's way out there. (laughs) And the Dillinghams are really established. Like, there's the cemetery on the hill, and almost everybody there is a Dillingham. So it's just like they're Barnardsville. Mm -hmm. That's the Dillinghams. This is Dillingham Road. And I'm just Mm -hmm. like. I think they're challenged by um, all the new people that have rolled into this valley over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. Understandably, like, now when a piece of property goes up for sale, there's a rush and a bidding war. It's insane. It's crazy. Even the last five years, I haven't been around 
I mean, it was already getting popular five years ago, but yeah. now it's like... Now there's bidding wars. Like, everybody's trying to move here, and there's constantly, like, as soon as a piece of property goes up for sale, it's like, wha-bam, 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 and like three times what it was being offered for is on the table. Whoa. Yeah. I'm like... Mm. You know, and I get it, because it is a really special place to live with the community here, but I feel concerned for the locals that we're gentrifying out of the place, you know? And it's like rural gentrification is just as intense as it is in the city. It displaces a different population, but we're displacing, like, the local Appalachian population that have been here for many generations mm -hmm. and already struggle to make ends meet. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel conflicted about that, mm -hmm. even as I live here, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't know what the answer is because it's happening everywhere. There's just like it's it's just the population problem. Like there's too many friggin' humans on the planet, and we all need to live somewhere. And we want to be around like-minded individuals as communitarian species. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know what the answer is. There's some neat projects in the area, like the community garden. I don't know if you've caught on to that. Heard about it? Yeah, it's like. Um, trying to plant food at the community center in a, in, a, in a community space that then goes to stock the food bank which serves 600 families in the in Barnardsville. Wait, 600 families in Barnardsville alone. Yeah, and maybe some of Weaverville because you know how it bleeds right there, mm -hmm. but not like Weaverville proper. It, it's a food bank out of the community center that serves, mm. like it just shows how poor this rural population is. There's huge drug problems out here. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, like when I'm in town with my other friends there and the other communities I'm part of, they're like, oh, you're out in the sticks where everybody has plenty. And I'm like, there's drug problems, there's domestic violence, there's all the issues, you know, oh. out here just as much. But it, sometimes I feel like there's even less resources out here for people to reach to, you know, less mm -hmm. support. So that's something that's on my heart. It's just like trying to figure out how to bridge those gaps and, and keep the relationships good between all of us who are flooding this alley and all the people who have been here for so many generations. And I don't know what the answers are, except to try to find commonality instead of differences, because it's mm -hmm. really easy to point to our differences, especially in the political climate that we now walk in. Yeah. But then it's just as easy in my experience to find our similarities too. Like, oh yeah, you, you know, like whenever I meet people, they're like, oh, you live over there where the teepees happen. <laughs> you work hard. I see you out in the garden all the time. And I'm like, yeah, hard work. That's a common denominator. <laughs> like, we all work hard. And and then, like, one of the next things that comes up inevitably, which cracks me up, is composting toilets or outhouses. Like, that's the next common denominator, which they ask about, which I love. Like, yeah, I shit in a bucket. And, you know, they're like, oh, we used to do that when we were kids. Yeah. Like, or they didn't shit in buckets. They shit in the river, you know. But, um or live pits or whatever they have their methods in the south um and then spring water like there's so many things that connect people but we always focus on like oh you have a trump sticker or you have a confederate flag and like i i'm triggered by those things but if i respond from that place i'm just deepening that divide mm -hmm. and so yeah i feel like that's a big part of the work out here is is learning how to connect with people who are really different from you and it's hard i know like you think of Asheville as I mean, I think of this still as a bubble of, like, the, the counterculture here, or the yeah. alternative culture, but obviously Asheville is a bubble away from the rest of the Appalachia around Asheville, you Which know? is a bubble in the south. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I ended up here, was just, like, I moved out from the west in 2001 and was just, like, blown away by the south, you know, coming from the Bay Area where when I was in high school it was like the De Calores movement and it was a celebration of diversity and it was like cool to not be white or it was cool to have friends who weren't white and it was you know I remember my my sweetie in high school his mom was like a Chicana activist and I went to like those kinds of rallies and meetings and in my naivety I just kind of thought that the whole world was progressing at that mm -hmm. rate <laughs> and then I moved here and I'll never forget it. I remember my ex-husband and I, we bought this house and I just like really wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be a, a stay at home mom and just raise my kids. And I'd finished college, but like, I didn't even think I wanted to have kids. And so when I did, I was just like, as per my style, like all in, <laughs> you know? And I remember we bought this house 
and I was just like, well, look, we own a house. And it was like a piece of shit that we got for really cheap because it needed to be gutted and totally redone. And I was like, yeah. And I was pregnant with Lily. My, my child was like one and or two or something like that. I forget now because it's been 20 years. But I just remember the neighbors came out and they were like, oh, hey, honey, we're just so glad you're not black. Oh, and no. I mean, I just was like... I remember my stomach felt like I felt like I was going to throw up on them. And then right then my friends who were Haitian and very black showed up to help us unpack. And they were like loud, fun people. Um, And the moving truck was there. And I walked over to my friend Fab and I just kind of disengaged from the woman who I, I had a strained relationship always after that. We lived there for five years. And I was just like, Fab do you know what she just said to me? And I was like trembling and I was just floored. It was like, I don't know. I know that there's still racism out West. I'm not that naive anymore, but it was much more underground and hidden. It was never in my face like it is here. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, I'm going to kick her ass. I was like, no, I have to live here. You can't kick her ass. She's old. Like you'll go to jail. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that was just like one of, I remember that moment because I, I, I felt like I made a mistake moving here and I felt like I was never going to be happy here or be able to find my community or my people, which is really ironic because it turns out like the deepest sense of community I've ever had is here. Mm -hmm. And now it just points to like so much of the work that feels alive for me is in trying to, I don't know, expand people's consciousness and and try to bridge the the disconnect that happens to allow things like racism to exist you know so yeah the classism where cult- yeah the cultural differences yeah i and found myself traveling out west ending up in places like rural idaho camping on some people's land who have very different political yeah feel like uh perspectives as me and i'm like okay i know that i'm able to be here because i'm a white a uh, woman or like woman presenting person or whatever and mm-hmm. like I'm in this how what what can I do right now to like I'm like undercover I'm like okay <laughs> like, yeah what do, I, what do I how do I exist in those spaces I mean I grew up in a rural conservative southern area like like this except flat it's different yeah but still there's almost less land connection in some ways Mm. than I feel like people have here because they have like the public land and there's like the wild plant connection that a lot of people have here that I cannot find many people where I grew up even connecting to the pawpaws and persimmons I ask people like you ever eat pawpaws oh I guess I heard my grandpa talk about them one time but I never eat them things. I don't know. I mean, no one talks about it but here I mean not that people are eating a million pawpaws there's not a million pawpaws (laughs) but there are like wild plant connections and bridges to be made around shared connection to that even though there's different practices you know the ginseng thing and all the ramps I I feel like there is still like a local connection to the to the life here and I I think maybe it's partially just like there is an industry here like mining and things that bring in different ways of depending on reality for your material needs like without that industry here I think a lot of these folks have lived in sustenance farming and tobacco farming and you said there isn't mining yeah like there I mean, isn't not nearby like West Virginia like I mean I guess up in Burnsville there's a little bit but that's yeah far enough. but it's not like this area is known for mining like some of the Virginias and West Virginias are so I wonder if that has to do with it just like there there's still a connection to the land here I mean I love talking to the old timers here and I will not get into politics with people, Mm -hmm. but if you can skirt that topic and religion, (laughs) there's so much juiciness in the connection, you know, like I go to the D&D sometimes just to like (laughs) talk to the old dudes and it's weird and it's uncomfortable as fuck, but like it's also such a wealth of, of information and like talking to them about the weather and listening to their predictions about what the weather is going to be like this year. They want to tell stories. They do, and they have interesting stories to tell, like, sometimes, you know. Sometimes. I don't know about the fish bingo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear that in my yom when I'm, well, I mean, I'm like, oh, till 5 a.m. sometimes. I've heard many, David Brown had a plan to take, like, a, 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 what are those, like, copters that you fly with remotes and, like, crash it into the loudspeaker. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's some people over there that have tried to go to the fish bingo to see what it's all about and they felt very unwelcome oh i'm sure they were like we're here to do the fish bingo and they're like i don't know what you're talking about that's what they're really yeah one person um this is one person's experience i'm like i, I mean i'm curious like what <laughs> what they he- brought and yeah. i don't know who it was and it's better if you don't tell me yeah. but um De- Devin and I have jokes about like taking his truck and trying to be in camo. Something. Well, or just not even like bringing the hula hoops and the kids oh. and some music and just being like, "What's up, everybody?" <laughs> yeah. And just like forcing them to accept us, which is sometimes my style of like radical inclusion. Like you're going to include me no matter what, because <laughs> sometimes you have to. Be like, I'm smiling. I'm not, I'm not dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, like, no matter how hard we try, we're not going to blend in. It's just clear. Mm-hmm. As soon as we start talking and don't have the right accent and don't, you know, and so rather than try to blend, like, just trying to show that different is okay. Different can be friendly. I haven't made it there yet. Like, I haven't actually got the gumption up to go, but it's something we've joked about for at least a year you know it's funny i'm like where do i fit in on that because i've tried to i tried to change my accent for years and grew up yeah and i'm like i go in the D and i'm like they think i'm one of those hippies but really i came <laughs> from a place like this not that far from here right and i'm like who am i am i one of the hippies or am i a country folk from the rural south i'm both i guess <laughs> I feel that way because I don't identify as a hippie. Right, I mean. But, like, <laughs> I go to my burn community or I go to, like, towny folks and they're like, oh, you're such a hippie. And I'm like, I don't smoke nearly enough pot to qualify for that. And I get way too much done, which is just, like, my total judgment to the term hippie. And they're like, yeah, but look how you dress. And, like, just, just look in the mirror. You're a fucking hippie. I'm like, it shows me I don't understand what that term means. I never right. really have. But... You know, just the way that, like, humans are compelled to label and categorize mm-hmm. things to try to understand and relate to them, you know? Mm-hmm. And I use terms sometimes that I, I'd rather not use, like, well, I won't even say them, but, yeah. you know, we all fall into that sometimes of stereotyping and, and generalizing and, and labeling to try to relate to people or, or just to convey information. And so I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, oh yeah, if someone calls me a hippie, they're just trying to emphasize that I'm tied to the land and I love nature and I'm not really into like high heels and makeup that much, you know, like, well, high heels, not at all. <laughs> I don't break my neck in some high heels. It's fun to dress up every now and then, but I still wear my chacos at the end of the outfit. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just like, I don't know, we all get so identified with things. And like, I am this, or I'm not that. Yeah, it's really ridiculous. Like, we're all just human. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be one of those people that's like, I don't see race, I'm, we're just the human race. Because I understand how that like totally erases people's experiences. Um, but then there is this part of me that's like, and we're a species on the planet acting in unison in a really destructive way and we have to own that side of it too like yeah there's all these differences that we need to relate to and simultaneously we have to be one one entity again to you know try to like have some change or progress it's really it's really schizophrenic feeling Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know to know how to orient yeah in these times and like wanting connection yeah and knowing that none of us are the same (laughs) you know yeah we have to figure out how to do that yeah yeah there's like a terence mckenna quote that i love that says we have to sign we have a a, uh, what does he say we have an obligation there's an adjective before it we have an some a paradoxical obligation to simultaneously dream and awaken and that has always really resonated with me as like a guide for how to navigate this reality like okay in any given moment i'm going to have to hold two truths that seem opposite and yet are linked and totally valid and it's weird and yet i feel like the more that we can do that the easier we can navigate the seemingly absurd (laughs) giant air quotes around the word reality (laughs) i mean that's the the dow right the true (laughs) dow yeah like holding the one in the mini holding yeah. those things are both simultaneously real yeah and Justin, joseph campbell talks about it it's like the tension of opposites and how like in the middle of that there's this sweet spot of truth and magic and and 
you know, not magic with a K at the end, magic in this sort of, like, awe-inspiring mystery of the universe sense, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I like playing in those realms, and I feel like it's part of my life work to be here and hold those roles, like, hold what seems impossible to be in harmony, and yet they can be if, if we can just, like, allow for the spaciousness and that tension to sort of create a balance, you know? Mm -hmm. It's super weird. That, like, the play is really where you find that it's never going to be just still. Yeah. I think it's why I love, like, <laughs> juggling and slacklining and unicycle. Like, oh, right. There's a slackline right there. I'm going to have to walk on it before I leave because yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, there's a trapeze there. But, like, these, these, um, these things that totally require, like, constant motion and balance. Like, as soon as you try to be still, you fall off the slack line or you drop your juggling balls or your unicycle tips over. And they're just, like, really great metaphors for me for, like, the spiritual realm of this reality of, of having to just be in that dance of, of motion and, and not becoming stagnant or still to the point of falling off, mm -hmm. you know? But it's hard because we get comfortable and cozy and we want, like we're like such weird creatures like again we're kind of schizophrenic by nature and we want everything like we were talking earlier about like i want to travel it's like the jerry garcia song like you're traveling you're tired of it you want to settle down you've been settled down you just want to travel and like i want my home and i want my epic gardens and i want my perennial fruit orchard and I want to go hike the mountains, and I want to breathe the desert, and I want to ferment in Hawaii, and I, <laughs> and, 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 but shit, then I can't grow this beautiful garlic, you yeah. know? It's, it's so hard. We want I know. it all. I'm like, home base, is there, is it possible to have a home, ba home base and still seasonally have other places I go visit and revisit? I mean, there's a lot of them I'm eliminating, too, but I'm like, yeah. I'm honing down for me, like, the places that I want to focus on the most, but yeah, it is like, you have to choose, too, like, what do you want to put your energy in? Because there's a finite amount of resources and energy that we have access to, and it's great, but it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to do it all, and I, I tried for years to find both, you know, like, what you're describing, and back and forth and bi-coastal and traveling in the wilderness and doing all the things and I had this dream of like oh well I'll just like buy land in different quadrants and rotate like you'll be here I've been but, talking about that with people too we're like we could buy a plot in Nevada that's where we'll have our pine nut camp and then we'll buy a plot in this other spot and then there'll be someone to, to caretake all those or anything like, I mean I don't know that's what I used to think of but then we realized that like <laughs> oh we all want to be at the same place in the same season so what about all the other parts of the year and like it gets really complicated as you know like community interactions and try and it's so funny after so many years of trying to figure that out I now have like my little enclave of one acre in Barnardsville on a road but it's lovely. I know we can hear it right now. We're just accepting that. Really. Yeah. Hearing. <laughs> you can hear the birds too, the birds. and the view of the mountains are beautiful. It's awesome. And there's a river that runs through it all. But, and for me, it's been about like land reclamation. This was really, you know, you you were speaking to that when you got here. This land was really uh, uncared for. It was tobacco land for a really long mm. time. Um, ancient river bottom land. So lots mm -hmm. of rocks. Lots of rocks and sandy soil, plus the depletion of like an extractive form of farming for many generations, like tobacco, has just left it really, um, it's just depleted, you know, I don't know a better word for it, but just feeling really taken from, like really pillaged and, and raw and, and just uncared for. And I've been here almost four years now and the amount of change affected on this little piece of land. In that short time. Yeah, with very little money input. Like, everything I use is humanure and free leaves and stuff I can scavenge and scrounge and beg for restaurants for their compost and bring in chickens. And I like... realized I should have brought my fancy camera and take some pictures. Oh, yeah. Because I do that with some of the uh, podcasts. I'm like, this is such a beautiful time to s if you're into it. I mean, you can come back and take some. Of the plants and the gardens and, like, I don't know. Yeah, like, I'm really, I like have this, like, <laughs> sense of pride that doesn't feel ego-based. I think it's just like, when I was a kid, I grew up in the Bay Area in like whitewashed apartment walls and I didn't have access to nature. But my folks were really young and 
my dad's always struggled with addiction and bonding, chemical bonding my whole life. And so there would be these periods of time I would just randomly get dropped off at my grandparents for like three months or six months. And I would change schools. And like I went to the school by my grandparents' house like four different times over the course of like five years. And, you know, people are like, oh, that sounds so hard. And it, it was in its own way. But the reality is that my grandparents' house is like the best memory of my childhood. You know, and my father, even though he is chemically bonded still... What does that mean? Uh, addicted, he has addiction issues with drugs. Okay. Um, like, he still taught me about camping. And when I was a kid in Colorado, we'd ride his motorcycle. <laughs> he would, like, get stoned and put me on the back of his bike when I was, like, four. And we'd, like, ride to Garden of the Gods and go hiking and hang out all day in old cemeteries and, like, collect pretty rocks. And, like, you know, he definitely didn't show up in a lot of ways, but... His parents uh, were immigrants from Italy. Um, my, well, my grandmother was born in the States and um, in Brooklyn. She grew up, so she's like very New York Italian. And then my grandfather came here in his 20s. And so he was a farmer. He came from an agricultural background in southern Italy. And so their backyard was just like a typical suburban. They had like, they were in a middle class neighborhood. He retired from Gallo Winery. And, um, their backyard, he grew probably 70% of the produce the family consumed in a tiny, and his backyard was just a paradise. There was fig trees and peach trees and cherry trees and mulberry trees, and he had San Pedro cactus that was like 30 feet tall and turtles running around. And like, I would just eat cherries and figs and apricots until I had the shits because I was like, oh, this is so different than what I get because my mom was like scraping to get by as a single parent in the Bay Area. She didn't have time to like cook a lot and she just, she did her best, you know, but it was a really hard, hard life for her and like such a contrast for what I had at my grandparents. And I remember making fun of my grandpa, like me and my cousin who was six months older than me and you know, her mom's also chemically bonded, and so um, our folks partied together, being brother and sister, and so we often spent the same periods of time at my mm. grandparents, which was really neat, you know? And I remember, like, making fun of my grandparents, because my grandma would, like, rinse off a paper towel and hang it on the clothesline <laughs> so she could use it again. I know, right? And my grandfather, we'd always be like, why are you burying the garbage in the garden, Grandpa? And we thought he was, like, crazy. Nobody talked about composting then, but he like had this really <laughs> intricate system of every night he had this trowel and he would open up the earth and put the, the day's scraps and then close it back up and That's then one way to do it. <laughs> and move it. And his gardens were bumping and I think he knew somehow intuitively being in this city in close quarters, like he didn't want this big stinking compost pile. He just and it's funny because I actually use that method now. I don't have a compost pile, I do for my human manure, but like I bury my compost bucket in the garden beds right where they go like and then I've read so much now about permaculture and principles and like oh yeah wherever your compost pile is the soil under it is the best soil so much of the nutrients just wash out in the rain here and so it's just it's so full circle my grandmother used to always complain that like my grandfather's mistress was the yard and now as I get <laughs> start to get older I'm like need a primary partner I got the garden I got the yard in is what I call it <laughs> so it's like wow I really am my grandpa <laughs> yeah it's kind of funny and weird I'm like I'm just I know you it does satisfy some special thing to have a little garden to tend when you in your human romantic life might be <laughs> challenging and you're like well I can yeah. or tending, you know, for me it's been like tending wild gardens or tending yeah. land and places that's on public land or you know I mean what is wildness? This is wildness too. It's yeah, where does thing. one end and the other begins? Yeah. It's a, a a big thing I've been exploring on the podcast uh, Ooh, fun. over the past couple of years. Yeah. You know, thinking about what is a garden and what is wildness. But you know, here if you think of wildness as self willed, I mean like pretty much you're always sort of playing with what wants to creep in and take over, or playing with what wants, you know, everything mm -hmm. wants to grow and you just have to decide what you want to choose to let take over versus in like a desert, it's a different dynamic, right? Yeah. 
so yeah, yeah. cultivating yeah. is really different out there yeah. <laughs> like, I let the purslane go and let the st john's work come in yeah but i might want to take out that gallon soga this time because no, you know it's like yeah yeah it's been really fun here just like learning I mean, I come from out west where it's really different, you know, from being... It's really different to grow things in an arid climate. You're working all the time to keep moisture in mm -hmm. and to mulch and protect it. But here, it's so wet. I'm working to, like, open up the space and let mm -hmm. air flow in and keep mold from happening or blight or, like... For water, water to go and run and move instead of yeah settle yeah too much somewhere you know it's yeah exactly like out there it's all about catch the water when it happens and here it's like oh shit how do I divert all this water <laughs> it's constantly mm -hmm. happening and it's been neat and that's been one of my like favorite things that I've gotten to do in this body is travel around the country and a little bit abroad not too far abroad um and just learn that way like learn what each thing does in its place and I always get tickled when I find a plant like equisetum because I find it everywhere and like in Hawaii it's 20 yeah. feet tall and I'm like holy shit you're like when you were 200 feet tall <laughs> and in you know upheaval dome in Utah it's like this tiny little scrubby weird plant that I can barely recognize as an equisetum but sure enough there it is like that's like the joy of meeting old friends in all of their iterations in different locales and how they show up and you know that's been something that I just I, I feel so lucky and gives you so much perspective in the place where you are yeah even if you stay somewhere like having done that I mean that's so much of what I've been doing over the past however many years of traveling too is like you always find a friend plant friends even if it's closely related to one somewhere else and it's such a joyous exciting experience to like yes. see you know like yarrow for example is everywhere yeah you know yeah to see different plants and how they you know where the cottonwoods grow and which rivers and you mm -hmm. know i don't know it's it's so cool yeah, um, I, I love that. There's a book called Reading the Forested Landscape, and it's about New England. Is this Tom Wessels? I think so. I can't think of it. It's got, like, all these lithograph pictures in it, and you, like, start by looking at the picture and then try to guess what happened, and then it unlocks mm -hmm. the mystery. It's like a detective book, too. Cool. Yeah, and it's only, like, for that very specific part of the country, which is actually the part I've traveled the least in. Um because I was always afraid to have to like get past New York <laughs> I'm really intimidated by New York and how crowded it is up there um but I love that like being familiar enough with so many different ecotones and landscapes that I can start to I mean I still feel like there's so much I have to learn but I can start to look at places now and be like oh that's this because of that mm -hmm. or, you know and just like really relate to the landscape in this personal sort of deep way like you said like seeing an old friend you know like oh look at this here that indicates a slide or why is there this big ass tree in the middle of everything huh this must have been a field at one point like just being able to read the landscape that way from having traveled and walked through so many different places it, it it's like it just how to say it I feel like we're socialized to be really uh, identified with a particular place we come from and that's our home and that's ours and I'm American and I'm from the West and I identify with Northern California and it's like we're giving our fucking blood type or something but if we can zoom out and be like oh I am from Earth in the Milky Way I'm human like it just puts things so much better and um, more accessible to see like connect the dots and see the bigger pictures and have mm -hmm. I think healthier relationships with each other and end with like the planet if we can start to contextualize it back into a whole instead of all the tiny parts we've broken it down yes. to <laughs> you know and start to see its big systems and realize like what an impact we're having on them but you know everything in our culture is about the individual and like right down to the tiny micro specific of like this blade of grass yeah. that's me and this is mine and then like we want to compartmentalize nature too i mean i think about a lot about like ecology is this concept that often i mean scientists have obviously a, a often you know conservationists or scientists have like good intentions but they're still like the compartmentalist 
this is this ecology and then next to it is this ecology. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like that people necessarily always speak of it that way. Obviously, so many of these plant communities, even though they literally could look different everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> meld and mesh and morph and, you know, like they don't. And I think if you're someone that's spent time traveling in awareness of plants and ecology, you see that so much more than if you just stay in one place. Yeah. And you can't unsee it once you see it, even if you do eventually stay in one place like you're doing right now. You yeah. Know? It gives depth to everything that you are around and all the life, you know, like. It yeah. connects the dots in a really good way. And like, <clears throat> I just can't even get into the native plant circles because I have this little side business called Tropalachia. <laughs> And I'm like growing taro and turmeric and all these really tropical entities who kind of love it here. And it just, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the traveling and then staying in one place. Like I've collected plant, I have redwoods growing here. I've collected wow. plant specimens from all over the place. And I know, I, I, try, I don't, I don't think I have invasives, but I What's mean, an invasive? <laughs> I'm an invasive. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Have you, you haven't been listening to my podcast, right? I didn't know it was happening. I, I learned about it last week <laughs> well, when you like put out that email. <laughs> it's so, been like four plus years, but literally this past year, we interviewed a bunch of PhD scientists about invasion biology and basically how... Oh, I can't wait to listen like, to that. I mean, I, I try to hold all of it. Yeah. And I understand everyone has different perspectives, but, you know, these people we interviewed... Um, they've studied like yeah the one person studies basically the whole history of invasion biology as a concept all together wow. and like where we get that in our culture yeah and then other scientists are studying like well where would you you know we call a lot of native plants invasive because they don't fit into what we want and there's them to like be. endemic where it's like this is only there's so many layers to it starts it. to fall apart and there's a I understand people's like wanting to defend the rare plants yeah too. totally but I don't think that we should necessarily not plant taro here where <laughs> maybe in 30 years that might be you know we, I mean like there's tobacco and soybeans and corn <clears throat> grown all over the midwestern prairie where it's supposed to be so it does aren't native <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Potato. I mean, it just depends on how far you go back. Like people are like, "Oh, Italian cooking, the tomatoes." I'm like, "Tomatoes are from South, South America. America." I was just talking about that today with Olivia. Really? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. That wasn't in Italy that long, you know? No. And at first they were despised, and nobody trusted them. They were like thought to be poisonous, and then they were thought to be aphrodisiacs, and like there's this whole lore just about something as humble as the tomato, you know? And and now, yeah. Yeah, we could go off on that tangent. And I do appreciate, like, I don't want to discredit the importance of preserving native plants that are endangered and checking invasive plants like kudzu and things that can get out of control. Even They're also I, not going anywhere. No. No so, matter what we do. So we might as well embrace them into our culture and make and learn them a part of our culture. And learn how to make baskets and medicine and yeah. food and all the beautiful things that these invasives I just can't help but identify with them as a human because we're invasive as fuck like we're the most invasive species on the planet I think and the most destructive obviously and so it's almost like we loathe these things that we are in this weird way we're like self-harming just by putting so much anger into this concept of invasive species and you see that extrapolated on like other race you know other races that move here or Without realizing we're that, if you go mm -hmm. back far, and you know, like the whole thing just starts to fall apart. It's mm -hmm. it's tricky. Tell me a little bit more about your tropical plant cultivation. There's other people doing a little bit of that. I went to Doug and Yana's up last month and was like, oh my god, there's just so much. <laughs> like this is so cool. So like, what are you growing here that you wouldn't think? I mean, um. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Like, uh -huh. I'm curious. Yeah. <clears throat> see the tarot over there. Apollo. That's from Yana, actually. Oh, cool. And I have some other that I got years ago when I was still in Tennessee at DeKalb Market. I just, like, went and got some tarot root and was like, I'm going to grow this because I miss it mm -hmm. from Hawaii. And it does great here. We get so much rainfall. Um, 
so like people are always trying to put turmeric and taro in greenhouses and I'm like no dude just stick them outside because as soon as you put them in a greenhouse it's like hyper dry in there and you have to irrigate it doesn't make any sense um they live through the winter those are my experimentals I have like out in the garden I'll show you I, I was growing uh, turmeric commercially for a few years mm -hmm. and selling it to like the co-op in different places um but I've been experimenting in these beds, which are just piles of leaves that a guy that runs a leaf business comes and dumps every fall. And yeah, Yana sent me those tubers. I think last year Doug brought them. Um, and I was like, oh, more tarot. <laughs> so I just stuck them in that bed with some turmeric as an experiment. And you know, it's a heavily mulched bed. I didn't add any more leaves though. That was like the original leaf pile. And they all, like that came Look back. Yeah. <laughs> There's no blight that messes with it. Bugs and critters don't recognize it as food. It's like super high in oxalic acid. So like, I don't think voles are gonna even get to it if they could. It does great out in the garden. Like the amount, I can't even eat all the food that I grow here. Like I just end up composting it, which then there's just like taro and turmeric coming up everywhere. Which is great. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you want. Yeah. And so I do have it out in rows in the other guard, like the other side of the, the yard, garden. Um, but those two, I've got some, I got some other, um, plants that got sent from Yana, another species of turmeric besides the, the classic one. I have it written down. I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. It's like super pungent and like highlighter yellow and kind of mm. camphory. Mm -hmm. It's really weird, but lovely. And then I have one little nubbin of this blue turmeric that came through from Mark Williams that I'm trying to like propagate but I lost it and then I just found it <laughs> out in the garden <laughs> mm -hmm. um also growing arrowwood <laughs> or no arrow root arrow I'm also growing arrowwood which makes arrows that's a viburnum I think and then arrow root mm -hmm. is really a beautiful little plant and then the edible canna lilies are lovely that's awesome I've fallen in love with those plants um of course, some of the tropical shamanic plants also dwell here, and, and those are really nice to have around. Um, they have to go in in the winter, as do a lot of these things. But I'm experimenting more and more with leaving them out and seeing what happens. So, yeah, there's probably more. I mean, I've got the Brugmansia. It gets like 20 feet tall here, which is amazing. Whoa. Yeah, do you see those white sticks that are really, like, as high as my house? Yeah. That's Brugmansia from last year. In the Bay Area, people, like, I, I remember walking around Berkeley and Oakland. Yeah. And, like, people have that in their front of their house next to a poinsettia they planted that turned into a tree. And you're yeah. like, wow. Yeah. That's what they do in, in that setting. I remember the first time I saw poinsettias growing or poinsettias growing in... Hawaii I stopped and like cried because it was like a 30 foot wall of these like red magic flowers everywhere and the same way that that plant does but that's another one that I just mulch with leaves and it comes back every year and there's one right here in front of us like they just they they propagate so well here and, and do really well um yeah I'm sure if we went on a little plant walk I'd find some more that are just escaping me right now are you growing manioca too no. That one. That was, I saw that at Doug and Yana's. Yeah. I don't know cool if I know that one. It's, I don't know a lot about it other than I've eaten, it's very tasty, the, the tuber, I guess it is. Uh-huh. Um, it's a tropical. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many. I need to go out there more. I need to connect more with, in, in the plant realm, you know, mm -hmm. Doug and I always play and do fun things together at gatherings, but... Um, I want to go hang out with them at their space more, and mm -hmm. I know that there's more plants I could bring in in that way to I the mean, garden. There's something to be said about like climate change and like and testing that edge, you know. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, even in the four short years I've been staying still here, you know, I remember the first winter we were on this land. Um, there was weeks at a time I couldn't turn the water on. I had to light a, ha a light in the pump house to keep it from freezing, and I haven't had to do that since the first year. Hmm. And now, like, I can cut the water on. There'll be a couple days that it's, like, too cold to turn it on where it doesn't get above freezing, but it's never more than a couple days now. And it's just really interesting in, like, how quickly, like, maybe that's a short trend, you know? Maybe this year we'll have a really cold winter, but, like, it's just profound to me how, how quickly it seems to be changing, you know? Like, that's a really tangible... Because we can't take a shower unless we can turn the water on outside. And I remember the first... Well, the first winter I didn't have the shower built, but <clears throat> it's like, 
the first winter that I had it built, which would be our second year on this land, there would be like a couple weeks at a time I couldn't turn the shower house on because the hoses would stay frozen. And this last two winters, it wasn't more than a day or two at a time that we couldn't turn the shower on. And so that's just really profound to me as you bring up climate change. Like it's, it seems like a process that's going to accelerate and for that reason, you know, like, yeah, taro seems really important because as it gets too hot, our crops that we depend on, like potatoes and things, might fail in a really big way. And so having other starchy crops that you can plant in the ground and just mulch and leave there until you need them. I mean, that's how they are in Hawaii. There's just like whole valleys full of taro. You don't plant them and take them all out of the, you know, you go get some food when you need it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I were to dig in the soil over there, there's there's hundreds of pounds of food just chilling waiting until we need it and to me that's like that's the kind of permaculture or agriculture I'm into I do grow my annuals and I love my peppers and tomatoes so I definitely mess with those and kales and greens and things but also with an eye on like what's gonna sustain us if our food systems fail even temporarily or permanently or whatever you know like what what can we all be doing like I just want everyone to like get that established and get some sun chokes established and get these things that Sochan. can <laughs> yeah I get this so Sochan's crazy this year mine's like five feet tall I'm like what, what are you doing usually you're like down here why are you what are you doing that's another one I hiked across Colorado last year and I felt it was everywhere I was like I didn't know it grew here yeah I didn't know that either <laughs> I mean in the guidebooks they call it cut leaf cone flower okay but it's the same species. Yeah. Yeah. I was like seeing the leaves. I was like, wait. Huh. And then, uh, then as we walked, it would fl it flowered, and I was like, yeah. I mean, this. Is, I mean, tasting it, smelling it, this is so chan. Isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah. That was one of my favorites years ago. Me and Mark and Turtle and Patrick walked up the Yuba River on like a ninety-mile hike, one of Frank's trails, and went from like Nevada City to South Lake Tahoe, and it was so much fun. Because, you know, Patrick and Turtle were like, we've got to hike 16 miles a day. And, dur, dur, dur. and there's me and Mark at the end. Like, the pokey little puppy's like, oh, my God, look at this plant. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at this. Oh, let's, let's sit down and let's, let's smoke a reefer with this plant. You know, we just like. That's why Gabe and I took way so yeah. long last summer hiking. Because we were like, well, that was our intention, too. Like, yeah. We were like, no. We're What's the here. rush? <laughs> like, you're here to see it, you know? Yeah. Like, that's what I would just be like. Why do we have to hike 16 miles a day? Like, yeah. at the end of the day, we're all going to camp in the same spot. Like, we're going to get there, you know? We'll stop and have lunch and swim in the river while you guys are like, Bruh! and it's fine. Like, I don't mean to be judgmental, and I, I love <laughs> those people. Um, but, yeah, different strokes for different folks. And that was one of my favorite things, though, is just, like, being with an epic botanist like Mark and and hearing like just I don't know like yeah you'd meet really weird weirdo plants like kadizzi and, and kadizzi yeah. <laughs> only grows really in the Sierra foothills Sierra yeah Sierra totally family. yep smells amazing <laughs> sticks to your clothes like cleavers yeah. I remember hiking in the redwoods up near my dad my dad lives at the south part of the like the entrance to Yosemite outside of Groveland's and hiking up there and meeting Kadizzi and being like, oh, look. But then other, like, running into other plants. I'm not having a good example in my brain right now, but, you know, things that I totally know from here. Red, red bud. Yeah, totally. It's a different species, but, you know, like, yeah, there's red And there's bud. dogwoods, you dogwoods. know. Yeah, it's just, it's so neat. And it's like when you bump into a friend out of context, you know, like... If I were to run into you in Mexico, I'd be like, holy shit, Kelly, what are you doing here? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it feels like that, you know, meeting our, our familiars that way. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Yeah, I've had Turtle on the podcast twice. Turtle! And one of them, he talked about his walk across California. Yeah, that's what we, like, yeah. three of us just decided to join him for a leg of it, you know? Yeah. So that was really cool. Um, hearing about and it kind of made me want to try it out after he told me about it but I have not yeah um, I mean it seems intense walking across the Central Valley to be honest that part of it but yeah there's parts that I was like whoa yo I do not want to join you on those wild hike up the Yuba from Paul and Jill's to South Lake Tahoe you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah, yeah it was really neat though you know just to connect and go like from from one side of the state to the other and be brave enough to go through those really public, dry 
yucky places <laughs> you know just that commitment to see through mm -hmm. a project not just to have the comfortable wild beautiful experiences but to like conceptualize the seeing mm -hmm. thing and follow your mentor and see it through you know it's inspiring that walk really inspired me yeah I think it's inspired me to do more of that mm -hmm. and so I'm definitely got that in my mind's eye did the Colorado Trail last summer. I did the Camino. That's something that Turtle and I connected over wow. to. I did it in like 2007 in college. That's really sweet though. Yeah. I was doing a Crossroad Pleasure Weekly and it was like, I forget the clue was like pilgrimage in Spain. And I was like, the Camino, I know that because of Turtle. <laughs> and it was totally that. Well, that, that walk is also like, you're not just in these so-called pristine places. Nothing is pristine, but like, right. You also walk from, like, one end of a city to another to get through, you know, wow. and you experience all of it. So yeah. you experience the, the wine country, and then all of a sudden you're in, like, weird Spanish version of suburbia, and then it's factories, and then it's, you know, suddenly then it's sort of, you start to get into more sh cobblestone streets, and suddenly you're in, like, the old downtown, mm. and then you walk right back through it to the other side, and wow. then you're back out into the woods, and you're like, whoa, or the desert, That's or whatever. Fun. Like, whoa. Yeah, it's yeah. different than a wilderness walk, but yeah. it was also that like, yeah, you're, it's intense <laughs> to see, to do that on foot. I mean, yeah, so many people hitchhike and travel on foot. It's really different when you get out and slow down. Mm -hmm. I did a backpacking trip through the Gila, the upper Gila on one, I think we were out for two weeks, maybe, I forget, it was somewhere around that same, like just under a hundred mile hike and we I remember we like got started we had stayed at uh Wolf's place outside of reserve where Kiva Rose and stuff is and then been there yeah <laughs> gorgeous so we had that as the intro and it was the year that the first traditions in western herbalism was happening so mm -hmm. we got to go attend that and do some recording as trade to be there and then <clears throat> they put us up and fed us like fucking pizza made with elk that was harvested by a mountain lion and on acorn crust oh just God. like yep. <laughs> you know how they roll like so amazing and then that led us into this two week backpacking trip and it was during elk hunting season it was in September of maybe 2010 um, and that was really like probably one of the wildest times as far as like once we got away from the trailhead and out he was it's wild i've done walks there too yeah, yeah. it's like as venetia madrano would say one of the last untouched hoops or like un unmodern unlike messed up hoops and i don't want to blow it up by being talking about it on the podcast like in that like you should go there and everyone should go back back there no <laughs> like, it's not for the faint of heart it's really hard and trails aren't it's marked rugged and like you the gotta river, know what you're doing if you're in, down in the canyon and the river yeah gets high you gotta find a way to hide away from the floods and but it was so lovely because after the first two days like we were deep in and we didn't see another person the entire <sighs> time and just met like oh the list of plants I made a mead <sighs> that was with all the wild plants that harvested while we were there. I probably have like a bottle left I could dig out and find. Oh my god, if you did, I would <laughs> love to look at it. Yeah, I can show you the list of plants and like in my mead journal, you know, that has every mead I've ever made written down and recorded in detail as per the Scribe Tribe. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's so funny, these parallels. Like, I didn't even know that you ever did that. And I totally, when COVID hit, I was in the Gila Wilderness hanging out with wow. Doug Simmons. I don't know if you never met that. The mule guy? Yeah. yeah. One time I lived in the southern Gila right above Silver City with like yeah. the Dee Dees and Chads and Pixies of the world. And we were out there for, I think that was where I had my longest time out. I think I kept following, when they would do supply runs like every three or four weeks, I would volunteer to stay with the kids. So I think I didn't leave for like 10 weeks or something. And we just like busted out camp on the river where the hot springs are down in southern Gila. And one day Doug wandered through with this woman named Peonia. And they just like hiked through and hung out. And we're like, yeah, we heard about you guys out here. Because we had a mess of kids with us and had set up a pretty elaborate camp. And we're staying put until someone forced us to leave. <laughs> Which they eventually were kind enough to do. Um, but it's interesting because that woman now lives in this community. 
Oh, that Peonia. That Peonia, okay. and that's where I met her. And, and it was just like the first time she rolled through, she was like, I think I met you. Did you live with a bunch of I didn't know she wild lived. people out in the Gila? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, why? how do you know that? You know, and it's so weird the way these, like you were saying, these circles just come back to you in these, these strangest and most lovely surprising ways, you know? I'm so curious what plants you used in that. I remember when we did a walk out there mm-hmm. um, and ended up camping in a hot springs and... I remember seeing particular a particularis that looked just like the one here. Huh. And I was like I, I mean, a- I've seen them all over the West and the high country and like, yeah, all like these they grow in Landica. Spe- yeah, like so many I mean Colorado alone we probably ID'd like eight wow. m- different ones on the trail. But like this one looked just like Pedicularis canadensis, which wow. here in Appalachia there's pretty much just one species. It might have different variations yeah. potentially depending on you'd consider the purple flowers and yellow flowers mm-hmm. whatever but it looked just like that I was wow like, hmm. yeah we found a particularis there we found a really big grove of wild hops that was totally bumping with flowers at the time because it was what? september so it's like a nice hoppy <laughs> brew um i think I, I can get my i'll get my mead, my mead yeah. out and i think there's like 27 plants in it there was equisetum there was some hawkweed there was Gosh, I'm trying to think now. Lots of... Well, there's a lot of... I remember seeing giant choke cherries huh. in the canyon. You know, the canyons is different than what you're, you're going to find on the mesas. Yeah. But, you know, choke cherry is like... I don't, does it grow here? It's mainly in Pacific Northwest. Yeah. But, like, they're usually tiny trees, you know, small yeah. medium sized trees. But there were choke cherries, like, huge out there. And we were like, what? I remember like, learning what? from Loba that there's that scrub acorn that if you pick it up and it's been on the ground all summer, it's like basically leached and ready to eat. And that was, I mean, she got me hooked on like acorn coffee with sweetened condensed milk. <laughs> it was the best thing ever. And just like the process that we go through with acorns out here and just, just being like able thing. to like scoop them up and crack them open and eat them because they've been so leached by the sunshine and, and they're low also, tannin anyway. Yeah, you know? some species like gambolo don't have, I mean, we, that's all there is in like southwest Colorado. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't. I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to harvest this year here. Because I could just go to Colorado and get gamble oak acorns when I go there. I'm like, it's funny when the world starts <laughs> to open up like that. Like, oh, if I'm here in this season, I'll get that. And here in this season, I'll get this. And yeah. and then conversely, like being in some cities, like I always mm-hmm. like to give a shout out to Davis because of all the feral fruit there that you can like wander around with a backpack and fill it with oranges and citrus and plums and pears. And and Sacramento. And, yeah. Y- yeah. All the things, you know. Winter in California is not a quiet time for harvest. No. It's such an abundant time. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> sigh. <laughs> you know, like, I made hoshigaki a couple times. Mm. <laughs> but being there, I, wow, the Gila connection. Do you ever miss some of these places so much that you're like, I mean, are you? Do you have this thought in your head? At some point, I'm gonna go back there and take a pilgrimage. Or do you, are you okay with like I might never go back there? Both. Yeah. Yeah. There's times I want to go back there to all those places I fell in love with and left like a part of myself. I used to have dreads and would like break off a dread and leave it somewhere if I really loved it. And I'm like, oh. But then there's like still so much of the world I haven't gotten to explore yet. So I feel conflicted in those places, like. Would I ever go do that same hike? Probably not, because there's so many other trails. That was one trail that I did in the Gila, and that was one time, like I did one deep stint in Northern Gila, Upper Gila, and one deep stint in the Lower Gila. But there's so many other places I haven't even hiked, you know? And so, yeah, I always think about Hawaii and that, right? You know, I got to go spend a year in Hawaii studying food and culture there, and sometimes my kids are like, oh, we really want to go back. And then there's other parts of me that's like, yeah, but what about fill in the blank with any of the places I haven't been, which is many, most places, you know? So yeah, I feel conflicted. It's like, again, like old friends, like there's so many old friends I left out West who I'd like to visit. And yet I'm also content cultivating the relationships I have here now, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. and, and the future relationships I don't even know I'm going to have yet, you know, like. I don't know. I don't know. And as I, as I start to watch the world heat up and change, like fossil fuel consumption gets a lot harder for me to feel comfortable with. Um, 
be it flying or driving. And so, yeah, that's part of what really energized me to find a place to stay put and to really put my time into community and try to cultivate, to try to see if I'm capable of being happy staying in one place, because I wasn't sure. And I'm still not certain, but... I totally hear that. Yeah. I'm like... (laughs) I figured you would. (laughs) I'm like... uh, I mean, it really depends on the place and the people and yeah all of it too but yeah and that was a big part of like my ramblings for some years there was lots of reasons for it um lots of reasons but a big one was just like I held this feeling or belief or I don't know what it was this idea that somewhere out there was like the perfect place (laughs) if I could just find it and I went all over like everywhere I heard there was a community I would go check it out and hang out and like you know, I, I'm, I'm such a, like, romantic in the big sense. Like, I would just fall in love with these communities and be like, I found it. It's perfect. And I'd call my mom and be like, I found it. And she'd be like, uh-huh. And sure enough, within, like, a month, I'd be like, that's fucking horrible. I'm leaving. The people are insane. Or, like, the landscape or whatever and ramble on to the next place. And... Yeah, like ultimately leading me to Hawaii, thinking I was going to stay there. And I just fell in love with that place so deeply. Like the plants spoke to me in this really loud way that like, you know, plants speak to me here if I get real like Stephen Bunard out and get real still and like (laughs) go to that place, maybe smoke some weed first to help out. But like, I remember when I first got to Hawaii, I went with the lover I had at the time And it was just this, like, spur-of-the-moment thing. My mom was like, do it. You never do anything. I'll keep the kids because that's always my concern. And he had access to, like, really discounted tickets and was down to just, like, backpack and do it on the cheap. And so I went. I was like, okay, I've never, I never, like, my, never really had these opportunities because I'm a mom. And, And I remember the second I stepped off the plane in Kona and my feet hit the ground, I heard the word vaccinium. Which is really weird, because, like, vaccinium's in Hawaii, you know? Like, it's just not the connection I made. And I was like, did you hear that? And the man I was with was like, what? <laughs> you're cra- are you okay? Did you drink too many Mai Tais on the way out? I was like, yeah, maybe. We'll just chalk it up to that. Jet lag, shit. But I kept hearing it, and it made me feel a little crazy, because, like, I don't really hear auditory hallucinations. <laughs> um, and plants, like I said, they'll speak to me, but I've got to get really still and, like, tune in. And so I just was plagued by this whispering vaccinium. (laughs) And so finally I was like, fuck, I gotta find a bookstore. And so I like asked around and turns out there was this great like local used bookstore. And so I bought some plant ID books and put them in my backpack. And um, that evening we found like Church of the Sea Star to sleep behind or something. I don't remember because we didn't make it out of the city, the city, you know, whatever. It was great. It was gorgeous. And... I'm sitting there like by by candle reading this book and I couldn't find vaccinium and so this whole time progresses and finally I found it and it's like this oh hello berry that the natives used to offer Pele to appease her and it's a vaccinium and I remember just being like whoa what the fuck is happening is it like, rare like, because it only grows on one type Yeah, of rock the only or place something. I ever found it was around the caldera, around Kilauea, around the volcano. Like, right around the volcano. Like, on and in Pele's territory. And, like, hiking all over the island and exploring, I never really came across it. And it was, like, that, that experience that just called me there. And, um, yeah, it, it's really magical, though. That plant was just like, yo, you're on Pele's territory. You better make the right offerings because you're here and um yeah it was a really unique feeling like I hear the landscape talk and I feel like spirits talk or whatever like not to sound all I'm like really into science too I'm not like super I don't know how to explain all this (laughs) you have to edit this shit no it's good (laughs) um yeah like (laughs) trying to balance both of those things though like trying to balance my scientific way of viewing reality with these experiences that just go beyond anything I can explain and that kind of make me feel cuckoo um but yeah they're real you know and so like this planet is so 
so profoundly powerful and mysterious and alive and it reminds me of when we were talking about this piece of land like when I first got here it was just 10 foot weeds and broken down school bus and and it was just it wasn't very lovely at all and I remember just like taking this giant weed eater to it and being like all right let's just clear let's just start with a clean slate and now after a couple years it's like I feel the land purr when I work with it. It's just like, oh, thank you, you know, like, and it, it, it brings forth so much more life than some of the, like, pristine, lovely, wild places I've had the privilege of growing food or gardening or tending. Like, sometimes there's, this reciprocal relationship I think with land that's been harmed and neglected that when someone shows up who's listening and loving it just like oh you know I just like I feel this sigh of relief that it experiences like even sitting here gesticulating and talking at it it's like yeah we love you it's great you know and and it's amazing because with like very little input, like so many people spend so much energy and time on amendments and soil testing and not to say those things aren't helpful. I've never done those things. It's more of like long term relationship, soil building, energetic exchange and, and it just like it all comes alive and gives back so much and, and just responds like the earth is so responsive to what we give it, you know. Yeah, it's almost like you said before. Like it is a lover in a way. You know? oh, like I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, but like you tend, even a little bit. You go, you walk around, and even just putting your eyes on things every morning when you wake up, and there's like attention. That attention is recognized by the plants. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and by the soil, and by like this magical being we walk on the back of every day. It's just like oh. Hey, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's lovely. I I feel so grateful that somehow I don't know. I became aware of that. I don't even remember when that happens or like at what point. It just sort of is now. You know, I attribute it a lot to like a lot of LSD in college mm-hmm. <laughs> of just like deprogramming and breaking down the walls of culture, um, but also just to being still and like taking the time to spend I remember being married and living in a house and trying so hard to make that life work and and literally feeling like I was losing my mind this is what I don't know if this was on air or before we were on air you were talking about how you like got married and you just wanted to have kids and be a stay-at-home mom and you bought a house and yeah was that here in the south or was that in California that was in Tennessee, Tennessee. I le- I got I got married and had my first child in Arcata and just like that was in the year 2000 and there was like roving blackouts even that far back because there wasn't enough power and you know my whole life growing up being in the bay area was fine but then my father lived in in the san fernando valley where it was like always hardcore drought conditions and and then the price of land it had skyrocketed before i was a an adult and so yeah we made the choice to just like come out here and I remember again like a dead song like well Tennessee Tennessee and my ex-husband had a twin brother there and I was like yeah I'm down to adventure let's do it so we just like packed up our meager belongings and dogs and kid and drove across the country and bought a house what um, part of Tennessee outside of Chattanooga okay yeah this is pre moon shadow yeah this was all connected though like I I started volunteering at a farm called Crabtree Farm, which is an urban farm there that does beautiful work in the city in um, sort of disadvantaged neighborhoods that are really don't have access to good food. You know, they have like the corner gas stations that sell shitty food and like that's their food grocery store if there isn't transportation available. Um, And so they set up this urban farm that's beautiful and they have like garden plots that local people in the neighborhood can come farm at for free and really neat stuff. And so I started volunteering there and I met some of my dearest friends on the world who are now out west. They followed me out to the west coast and then they moved to Hawaii with me and then I was like... I'm going back east and they're like not it we're not following you back east again and they're they're deeply immersed in the northern california 
scene now and I, I love them dearly we had our kids together but we bought these houses side by side and like had gardens together and just were like I had goats and chickens and was like growing weed in my backyard and it was like it was a neighborhood <laughs> it was so weird and there was just our two families in the middle of this like Trans, they called it a transitioning neighborhood like people of color were moving into it and the the local white folks who had been there for a while were really upset about that and so it was just like it was a culture clash on so many levels I also remember the name of it was Wakanda Shores and Black Panther's my favorite Marvel movie and so like my twins were born at home on Wakanda Shores they think that's really cool um but yeah, it was a really conflicting place for me to live. I didn't feel at all connected to the community there. And I remember wanting to connect with, like, the newer families of color moving into the area, but not knowing how to do that without being kind of patronizing and weird. And so, yeah, I was out at this farm, and that's where I learned a lot about... I mean, that was my whole introduction to organic farming was at Crabtree. And it was at a social function there that I met the folks out at Moonshadow and uh, started doing markets, selling art and soap and herbal remedies and things um, with, with some of the people that live there. And that's, that, was my, that was my big, like, oh. You know, I remember Rachel, my friends were Raymond and Rachel, who, who bought the property next to us. And this was in 2008, so there was, like, a housing crisis going on, too. And remember, they sold their house. We, we actually, like, petitioned Moonshadow to start a community on their North 40. And, um, you know, we were so naive. Like, now that I look back, I'm like, oh, my God, this was in 2008. And, like, I didn't know shit. It was awesome. <laughs> and typical to Aries Leo fashion just like jumped in feet first without really even thinking about any of it <clears throat> and it was just being driven by the fact that I knew I had to get out of my house and leave my husband and that like that lifestyle was never going to make me happy um it was like preventing me from being happy um so yeah Raymond and Rachel moved out and they sold their house in January of 2008 or maybe it was February and by April when we were trying to sell ours the market had completely collapsed and so I remember just looking at my husband and being like I don't care like I'm not staying here you can do what you want but I'm not staying here and <clears throat> yeah I just we let it foreclose because we couldn't sell it and you know in hindsight that it would have been better like for him to stay there and yeah it would have been all really different but um moved out to the north 40 of moon shadow with some goats and some chickens and some kids and <laughs> just really naively started this community and um really quickly into it I realized that I needed to just like break away from everything and do my own thing for a minute and so that was like my first road trip and I waited till my kids were two before I felt like because I had twins that I felt like I couldn't leave their father until they were two because like whoa it was already crazy because I have two older kids too so my mom rented us this car because I, my ex-husband was upset and decided to keep the vehicle that we shared. And uh, so I was like, I want to go out west. I want to see my family. I want to go meet my friends and harvest seaweed on the Lost Coast. Um, I had plans to go to the Rainbow Gathering that year uh, and didn't, which was a good thing. But, um, yeah, we ended up putting like 8,000 miles on this little rental car that my mom got for us. And I'd call the lady every week and be like, oh can I keep the car one more week? Cause I'm still out West. And she's like, I look forward to your calls every week. It's the most exciting part of my day. And I was like, wow, you should change your life. <laughs> and yeah, like we stayed gone, I think eight weeks. And so I got back and like two of my goats had died and half the community had moved away. And you know, I, I didn't realize a lot of things. Like I was sort of the instigator of the situation. And then I left while it was still in its infancy um, so then I just ended up living on that land by myself for a while, <laughs> which sucked. And then I got, I got offered a position at Moonshadow taking care of, uh, the grandma for the winter, mm. which was really nice. It brought us into an indoor space that was, I was living in an army tent and it leaked and it was fucking, I remember one time it was raining and there was like a river running through it and we just like ditched it. So there was like literally my kids in this bunk bed with a river running through our tent and like my bed over here. And they were like jumping back and forth and they were like, look mommy, there's crawdads in our tent. And I was just like, this borderline is, this is not, this is not okay. 
And so, yeah, like, got into that, and then my years at Moonshadow were just, you know, like, so nourishing on a lot of levels. Hard because of romantic stuff, Mm -hmm. Um, but also super transformative. And I feel like during my years there in Ulanawi, which was a little side community that started in conjunction with with Moonshadow, um, I don't know, I sort of discovered myself again, like who I was before I got sidetracked into this like, oh, the, the American dream, I'm going to buy a house and get married and have kids and homeschool, and yeah, that turned into like the American nightmare. And, and then I just sort of rediscovered, like, my passions. Because when I was, like, 19, I was into homesteading. My mom had picked up this stack of old Mother Earth news magazines, like, back when it was cool. Like, in the, in the 70s when they were writing, like, really useful DIY articles before. Like, I feel like that magazine now is just, like, a slick, glossy, here's how to buy a $1,000 composter and put it in your backyard type of thing. And the old copies were really helpful. And they just, like super fed my imagination and I tried that lifestyle then in northern Arizona where I was going to school in Prescott and I I had a sweetie that had like 10 acres out in the middle of nowhere and we just like I I planted my first garden which like immediately got eaten by free-ranging cattle (laughs) but it was the intro and then I veered away from that in a lot of ways and then going back to Moonshadow just sort of like reinvigorated my love of the wild and and gave me a like really good example of what it can look like to live with the earth um and then that's where I fell in with the fairies from short mountain and met sander and that just like started a whole nother chapter in my life called the fermentation years which I'm still (laughs) deeply in the middle of (laughs) um yeah, so Moonshadow was, was definitely a, a super transformative experience in I my guess life. I, uh, yeah, I first met you when you were still living there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was on and off there for like, shit, seven years. It took me a while to figure out that that was never going to meet my social needs. It's really an isolated spot, and I, it turns out I'm kind of extroverted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, You're right here in the middle of everything now. I know, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's I, so many fun as well as... And I'm, like, in the middle of it, too, and being so accessible. Like, folks roll by all the time, and, like, the Native American church meets on this land, so there's always those people, and sometimes I'm like, fuck, I wish I was just out in the wilderness, but then when I was out in the wilderness, you know, I was, like, doing the pheromone projects at gatherings to have my tribe in a bottle because I was so disappointed and depressed. It's interesting hearing you say all this because I find myself in such an interesting part of my life where I'm like thinking about all those things and now I'm seeing you like after you figured out like what worked and didn't I'm like oh god like I can't live in the wilderness with just like a couple people forever no (laughs) I tried I kept trying too and I kept thinking like oh this is the group or that's the group or if I just could get the group right and and it becomes really codependent, like, mm-hmm. because if any part of the group fails, then all of a sudden you're isolated. And I'm, you know, coming to this place now where I realize that connection is like the biggest need people have. And so many of us who are in this sort of like earth based rewilding or whatever we call it, you know, trying to find connection with the earth, we, I think, often go so far that we isolate and lose connection with each other. That, and indi- that like individual, what do you call it? The lone, mi- lone wilderness, lone person in the middle wilderness myth. Yeah, thing, like that. Yeah. Or like you said earlier, the lone wolf. Mm-hmm. And I resonate with that because I I lone wolfed it so much of the time. And even though I had my kids, like that was even hard harder for them, and they had each other. But I often didn't have grown ups, you know. Or I had a couple who were as crazy as I was and dysfunctional. We were all super dysfunctional and using substances because we weren't connected. You know, we weren't really connected. And that's, like, part of the story we don't really tell. Like, we we romanticize it and talk about, like, oh, it was so wild and so beautiful. And I was out for 12 weeks. Or I only ate what I harvested, you know. And those things are super, super awesome and valid. But 
in that can also be a lot of substance abuse and dependency because of disconnection from a healthy social unit. And, you know, I think that's what led me back here was one of my oldest friends, Sila, you know, she's got my back in such a way and I've got her back in such a way. And, and just coming back here, I remember before I left, I was like, fuck Asheville, everybody moves to Asheville, I'm not moving to Asheville, blah, 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 and, you know, that encompassed this area, it was just like this general, because it's like, Asheville is this oasis of progressive thought in a sea of really, I'm going to try really hard not to label it, but it's, it's a hard place to be, I think, you know, for folks who want to transcend the dominant paradigm, or shake things up, or or live in a different way the south is really oppressive that's why i gave up on the family land that i own or my parents i don't own it my family owns a couple plots that have been in our family that i it's not like there's any cool anything near or in it like 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 here at least you have some like-mindedness yeah we have Asheville to go to and now it's turning into like just a tourist trap I know I have literally not gone downtown the whole summer don't do it on the weekends I don't even want I'm like why Tuesdays are kind of okay like a Tuesday afternoon I'm like what do I even need to do down there yeah I don't I'm also like having I've had a hard time integrating in the culture shock of being Mm. I only interacted with like 10 different people last year or something and now like too many too much yeah. I can't even drive to town. It's too much highway and too much beer everywhere and too much Yeah. Too much cologne. Wafting on the breeze. I can't <laughs> too much cologne. I know all the droves of see I don't wanna make Nope, yep. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'll stop there. I know it. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> but anyways, you yeah. you came back and see the I came back and just realized that like the big awakening I had or like revelation was that it didn't matter where I was as long as I was with the right group of people and it's not like there's like a right or wrong group per se but for me it was where am I going to find a large concentration of people who want to grow grow harvest produce food in a sustainable way because that feels like a basic ground one and who are interested in the values that I feel are the most important, like protecting the environment and trying to change culture and like getting out of dominator culture and admitting our colonialism and like recognizing our privilege as white people. Like, where am I going to find the, and, and, you know, it's not to say that like everything I just named is happening perfectly here because it's pretty white here. It's really hard <laughs> to bridge that one. As soon as I said that one, I was like, oh yeah, that one, that one, I feel like Which one of the people sh- that's really yeah. pushing on the fire for that one, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you travel in Southwest and you're often a minority mm-hmm. and like largely indigenous dominated spaces yeah you know like I never knew growing up in the south that that was real and it's funny where I grew up like at one of the high schools I went to I was in the minority as a white person and that's I realized that's a rare experience for white people and I'm so grateful for that because it has totally informed my my perspective of humanity in ways that I couldn't even see coming because I didn't realize how oppressed other places were still now like now you know and that's some of the connections and work that I do go do in Asheville it's not downtown it's you know Grind coffee shop on the river arts district is like a little hub of activism for for the black community in Asheville and I've been like diving into grant writing through Firefly and wrote a grant with them about like how to get resources to go into people's homes and just do basic repairs uh, I don't think we'll get that grant because it was my first one, but uh, I'll find out in a couple days. But trying to trying to identify, um, you know, where the work is that we can do and how we can affect change. And I'm trying to find the balance now. You know, I, I realized by running off into the wilderness for so many years like mm-hmm. I did that that wasn't also, you know, that also wasn't going to meet my social needs and my needs to feel like I'm contributing to society, um, which is really big for me. It's not on everyone's list, but for me, 
I feel such a connection to this planet that I can't just continue to take from it as a human. Like, oh, I get my 80 years if I'm lucky and then I die and I'm just going to take the whole time and amass as much shit as I can. Like, I don't really understand any of that. And I, I feel really called to do work that gives back in some way and, and points a light to like how much we receive from this like ever generous planet. Um, and yeah, that, that works in the South for me, like that aligns with what was so shocking when I first moved here <clears throat> in, in the race relations, particularly and like how segregated this area still is and how little mixing there is between yeah. social strata and class structure and and now you know that's it's like it's all it's all feeling really serendipitous for me because firefly was sort of handed to me in this like i never would have sought to become the director of the firefly gathering (laughs) and it just kind of worked out that way through a series of events and um you know i don't know like now i feel like i have this tool this gathering that has a lot of social credit and clout and it's got its baggage too but history yeah what doesn't you know and so that's that's like a a lot of joy in my life right now is is figuring how to take this tool and use it in all new ways that it was never used for you know like we're launching year-round classes right now and then working on this aspect of it that's like a community connection where we're building um like a social calendar to try to connect with the different racialized communities in Asheville and connect them with the well-meaning very white community that is the Firefly community like there's so many people that have come to me and been like I'm uncomfortable around people of color what do I do or I want to help but I don't know how to get involved and I'm like okay there's an opening there's a need I see in our community and you know then I go hang out with friends in town who are like wow we really wish we had access to what you do but we can't afford it or we can't go camp for five days we have jobs like I wish we could take these classes but just like a class and I wish my kids could do that and so just trying to find ways to hear all those needs and 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 create an opportunity for them to come together where you know like I see the needs of people wanting what we have and I see the needs of the people who have what we have wanting to share it and like just there's this gulf and so that's that's the work I'm really focusing on right now is is bridging those gaps that I see or that are brought to me and trying to do that in a good way that isn't like I'm the great helper coming to patronize you (laughs) you know like just just trying to make connections and, and opportunities for connection and I just I feel like our whole species is suffering from addiction and it's addiction to power it's addiction to substances it's addiction to porn food media whatever it is fossil fuels comfort um and i think that at the base of all addiction is a lack of healthy connection and if we can create and design more opportunities for authentic connection For everybody, you know, then I feel like we can actually start to touch the source of some of these really big problems that can feel like completely overwhelming and unapproachable. If we just are like, how are we going to tackle this? Like, you can't tackle it. You've got to just like dismantle it one thread at a time. It's like unweaving a tapestry and then deciding to like redesign the whole thing. And so I feel... Incrementally. yeah. Yeah. It's so tricky with like wanting to connect and I mean I'm reflecting on different times in my own life Mm -hmm. where I've been very like um here I'm giving connection and it's doesn't that doesn't doesn't just work like that and it's tricky to know like yeah navigating like so much of our world is in pain and where people are addicted and Mm -hmm. yeah because of a lack of connection but then sometimes people fear connection and hide from connection too and that's painful to like navigate and dance with too if you're trying your best to not do that I mean I've done that plenty in my life too you know yeah totally it's protective but then on the in the end like you don't change things by doing that from hiding from connection because ultimately you'll hurt yourself yeah we isolate we isolate and perpetuate 
and it's hard you're 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 really right on i think it's it's really hard to uh to bridge those gaps with some folks and that's just part of accepting that people have to be ready you know you can't you can't fix a situation that isn't identified yet you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped and it's perfectly fine for people not to be ready but you know there then conversely there are so many people who are like yes I want that I want to do that I I want to make a basket or I want to take a communication class or I want to do yoga or I want you know fill in the blank with all the things like I love Firefly because it's a really eclectic group grouping of classes it's like some of the other gatherings are focused like just on traditional or what some people call primitive skills and I find those really awesome because I feel like they're unifying like all peoples everywhere made friction fire they might have used different trees and they might have had a slightly different technique or like cut their hearthboard a little different but like all over the world humans rub sticks together to make fire and that's awesome to me um all over the world people fashion bows you know, there's different materials we used for arrow points in different ways. And so I think it's really important to, like, speak to those lineages when we're practicing a tradition that comes from the Cherokee or from Africa or from whatever. Um, and yet there's something really unifying about those skills that um, remind me that we're all the same at the base of it all. Like, we're all humans that evolved from a similar same common ancestor that did these same skills you know even fermentation like my personal passion it's found in every culture on the planet dating back like as far as we can find archaeological records fermentation vessels are like one of the things we find like you know that and like fire scars in caves so it's like so I've even read some people postulate that humans may have like participated with fermentation before learning how to harness fire and that just blows my mind that like we could have been working with the microbes before we even knew you know we might have kept a coal going but like before we knew how to make fire and so I just I find those kinds of things really comforting because they're the unifiers they're what bring us together in our similarities as opposed to dividing us in our differences you know Mm mm-hmm growing food this whole time you've been <laughs> processing your garlic just so folks know what, what the that sound, sound is. is I love it <laughs> I don't sit down very much so when I yeah. do I'm like okay I have needed to do this <laughs> mm-hmm. I know, and then the traffic slowed down on the main highway here mm-hmm. too like, rush hour people came home from town yep Come to their families and just peeling the garlic <laughs> just a day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you, your the main thing you ferment is like I mean, there's all kinds of ways to ferment, but you're you're kind of known to be like a mead person. I make a lot of mead. Yeah, <laughs> I do that. I do a lot of. I just did like six gallons of kimchi recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of ferment everything and get my hands on. I, I don't drink a lot, but I love making mead. I love mm-hmm. the alchemical process of preserving plants that I find in the wild or grow in the garden in honey water. Like, it's such a good way to take your medicine if alcohol isn't, you know, some people can't really participate with alcohol without aggravating their bonds. <laughs> um, for me, that's not something I, I personally struggle with. And so... I I love having like a small pour of a beverage you know I often have a bottle open in the fridge and it stays there for sometimes several weeks before it's finished um connecting to that time and place and those plant spirits in that moment yeah I had a friend over this last weekend and so I pulled into the cellar and, and reached deep into the crates and I pulled out um a mead I made on a ganja farm in Kovalo in 2011 oh, and I spent a season there when uh, it was totally legal and it was the one year that you could have 99 plants and so there was just a lot going on and it was all legit um but yeah I opened that and I've made several of that that variety of mead and when I opened that I was like overwhelmed by the smell of Kovalo 
and the aridness there in late summer harvest season and how the entire valley reeks of weed and the the mineral rich quality of the water that I used to brew with and the blackberry jasmine was the strain that I had a bunch of to brew with and like all of that you know and then I opened another bottle that uh was a red wine I'd made at Moonshadow one year me and Patrick got super bougie and we ordered these like organic <laughs> grape juice kits from Fr- I, he picked France I picked Italy and his molded and he was gonna dump it and I was like oh hell no that's a fine mold on top have you ever seen the must on top of the wineries like I'll take your wine your bougie ass bucket of organic grape juice we bought and, and I opened that and I had like mold it with like slippery elm and kava and it was just like wow and then the third bottle I picked was one that I made uh, with Frank and it had the OSHA that we harvested in New Mexico at the Rainbow Gathering in 2009 and that's when I first met that OSHA species Um, and I just opened it and it was made with like that high desert water Mm. And I just like instantly was transported to that time and those places and those people. And I think that's what I love most about making mead is that it's one that you can keep long term. You know, you can't keep kraut for seven years and or even longer and, and taste it that much later and have it still be yummy. But um, I mean, maybe you can. Somebody will correct me as soon as I say a thing. But having a bottle of mead that comes from 2009 and 2010 and you open it and it's it's magical you're just transported there you know it's it's great but yeah I ferment everything that was one of my joys in traveling was trying to get in touch with local local people from wherever I was and find out what what was fermented there and what what they did you know how did you carry around that like, I haven't fermented that much on the road because I did it a lot before I traveled more, like when I lived here last, more like fully, and then I've made little spurts, like in Colorado last year, I made some, and then like, mm-hmm. made a little bit when I was hanging out on Paul and Jill's. Yep. But like, I've been just like, how do I carry around? <laughs> I have that little trailer out there, Yep. and I had it built out with shelves. And now it's kind of taken apart and more storing my clothes because it's like a dry, it doesn't mold in there. And I store chicken feed and clothes and like a few things I don't want to mold for sure. But I had it built out with shelves and I just had milk crates. And I remember a couple times traveling, like we stopped at uh, Lake Isabella in California. Do you know that hot spring? It's one of my favorites. It's so beautiful. And we rolled in late and like set up camp and there was a group I was traveling with and the next morning we had just gotten into California it was like after the Gila for so long and then all these other stops along the way we like finally made it to the eastern side of California and I was just so happy to be back home it had been a long time and a long journey to get there and um went to the hot spring at like two in the morning and then on the way back I remember hearing voices with a southern accent and I was like oh that's funny and so then we went and like just conked out and slept well woke up and went back to the hot spring and it was a whole group of people from short mountain in the hot spring and it was like people i knew it wasn't just like oh we was like leopard holy shit you're here what's going on and and it was amazing and so i remember them being like oh we really wish we had i think they wanted kefir grains and I was like, I got you. And they're like, you just rolled in. How do you have coffee? I'm like, oh. Yeah. And I opened my trailer and they were like, holy shit. Because there was just like. A little mobile fermentation. It was like the traveling road show of fermentation. And like they had a bunch of folks. And like we just sat and had like an impromptu two hour share of like all the cultures I had. And I think we made a meet. Like we just did it. We just like jumped into it. And they gave me, like, this big bag of weed. And I was like, oh, my God, it's so good to be back in California, you know. Because out here, man, it is a different world. And so, yeah, I just did it, you know. I just built systems and containers. And there was definitely, I remember when we, we went into the lower Gila at Silver City. And you meander down, 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 down forever. This, like, bumpy-ass, hard-to-navigate road. 
And when I got there, I opened up the back and the jar that the kefir had been in broke. And so there was milk all over everything. And of course there wasn't like a hose. So I was like bucketing water from the river and taking out all my shit. And I had these barred owl wings that like milk had gotten all over. Oh, no. And they were all dried and beautiful. They were roadkill here in the east. And so I took them to the river and like tried to wash them. And then I put them on the windshield to dry. And that's like right when the ranger showed up and was just, oh no! I mean, each one of those feathers is like a $10,000 fine, you know? And I was just like, oh my God. And I just remember talking to him being like, cause he thought we were there poaching animals. Oh. And I was like, wait, just slow down. You seem really intelligent and like you love the woods. Like, look at these wings. They're not from birds you have here. Like, look at them. Because our birds look different here. Thank goddess. And he was like, okay. Like, I had to talk him down. Like, he was going to oh, kill me. He was so mad at me. Like, he thought we were just a group of assholes out there killing things in the woods for their parts. And, um, you know, that was a real, like, telling moment for me of, like, oh, I need to be more careful with what I'm doing. And realize that I have an effect on these people who, yeah, they're Freddies. But, like, they're also really loving humans who want to protect the wilderness, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was a real, like, teaching moment for me. But, yeah, that's how I did it. I just, I just did it. I just, I used, like, uh, plastic jugs instead of glass carboys for the five-gallon batches. And because it was just too heavy to haul that much glass around. And, yeah, the plastic thing. But, like, I don't know. I'm not a purist. I live in a world made of plastic. I can't get away from it. So I gave up on trying. And, like, sure, I try to minimize it. And I don't. You know, I try to, like, reduce the amount of plastic I interact with. But at that time, it made a lot of sense. And, and those are some of my favorite brews now. Like, you know, when we lived in the lower Gila, I made mm. one there. And it had, like, choya root and the artemisia that grows there. Prickly pear, maybe? There, uh, there wasn't any that I found. <laughs> I would have. Throwing out names. Fedra. Yeah, there was some ephedra <laughs> in it. There was, like, some... Um, what do they call it? Creosote bush? Chaparral. Chaparral. There was, um, what's the berry in the tree? Uh, super hot, no, not hawthorn. What's it like hard as a rock? Red berry, dried. Mm. Mm. I, I have it written down. It's just been so long and my brain isn't what it's, it. I don't know. Not hawthorn, but. It's not hawthorn. I'll look it up. But like that Mountain one. Inch? But that's more high. Up yeah, no, high. this was in the lower part. I'll look it up. I can't remember right now. It'll come to me. But then I remember in the, like, many weeks that we lived there, it rained once for about a minute, and it was on spring equinox. And everybody was running, because we'd all just built camps out, you know, because there was no bugs and there was no rain. You know, the west. And <laughs> I remember everyone running around to, like, secure their camps and cover their bedding, and I was like, oh, my God, I have to capture the rainwater. And so I just went and, like, took the lid off the bucket that the mead was, like, in its primary fermentation with all the plants still. And so it has in it, like, this one minute oh. of rain. <laughs> and when I open that, it's just, like, it's the desert. Like, it smells and tastes like the desert it's it's amazing so those are some of my favorite meads uh a few months ago i opened up one of the last bottles of mead i shipped back from hawaii and it was a like lilikoi and i i just started crying i took a drink and just instantly was like so affected by the flavor it's like you know and it's rain catch water from the island and like just being able to re connect with those places through something like that you know there's no other way to do it you can look at pictures you can tell stories but like when you take in the essence of a place through this like sealed vessel it's it's mad it's so magical to me and transformative and yeah I could ramble on about that for a <laughs> long time <laughs> I'm kind of repeating myself no, it's, wonderful. <laughs> it's bringing me back to some like yeah mm. my time in the Gila and yeah. probably we'll be back there this winter but oh. <laughs> yeah. oh. I'll have to send you some plants yeah it's like <laughs> a vial of rainwater. <laughs> I remember there was an arsenic spring and I put like a tablespoon of that water in there <laughs> and like some of the river water and some of the hot spring water and just like the different spring waters from everywhere and like a rock from that place and oh, oh it's just so good yeah mm. I, I love nomadic fermenting it's um 
it takes a knack to figure out a system so that you don't have milk all over all your stuff. But once you dial in that system, I don't know, I feel like my ferments were really happy then too. Like now I have this outdoor kitchen and I have like, I feel like I live in a really bougie life. Some people crack up when I say that. They're like, you live in a fucking shed. I'm like, this is so bougie though, you know? Like, yeah, I I joke around and like, I make poverty look good. (laughs) And I I have this like desire to write a book on that, like rethinking poverty or reclaiming poverty or something because we're sold the story of like, you got to make $100,000 a year and you need to blah 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 and if you have to buy all this shit and you're a failure if you don't and what's wrong with you for not wanting that and I don't know I think we can totally rethink that paradigm and feel really successful with very little and like not only can we but we kind of have to Mm -hmm. to make it on the planet you know but I, I look back at those nomadic fermenting days and like my kefir was way happier then I don't know why I can't I tend it way better now but like they're alive. I think, you know, sometimes they like the attention and the adventures too. And sometimes I think my meads were better then because I gave them more attention. Now I'm like, there's so many projects and I'm like grafting Asian pears onto pear trees and <laughs> like there's so many things that, you know, sometimes I, I like, I don't even brew that much anymore. I mean, I do, I have like at least 15 gallons brewing right now. But I used to have a lot more, you know, and not traveling. I think the most I ever traveled with was 25 gallons, like five, five Mm -hmm. situations. And I would just like go to a place and set up shop and like source all the materials, either borrow them or buy them or trade them. And usually it's pretty easy to find like a small community of people who are into it and like either want to learn or already know. And then I would often just leave like all that equipment with those people when I traveled away. And I like to think about that because it feels like a lot of little incubators of Mm -hmm. how we spread, you know, culture. And I always taught this class called cultural flocculation, which is just like this metaphor. And of course, my teacher and inspirer, Sander Katz, and he just published a new book that's the metaphor of cultural Mm. transition and sharing through fermentation and yeah it it feels really good I feel like it's a way we can reconnect with our ancestors again because like we said earlier every culture has a history of fermenting even the most nomadic people like I remember coming across a study that uh, studied the Maori people and it was thought that they didn't have fermentation they like walk around naked there's no way they could have been fermenting and then um And there's, like, people studied it and couldn't find a history of fermentation in their culture. And then somebody went and spent time there, and it turns out there's, like, some tree that makes a bean, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's, like, unless they put it through a fermentation process with water, they can't eat it. And so it was, like, even this, like, highly mobile people have relationships with fermentation. And and that's amazing to me, you know? Like, again, Mm -hmm. it's, like all these quote primitive skills are actually like really sustainable technologies that have made it to our point in the story because they they are sustainable they hold up they hold up and i think about it in terms of health like right now people are eating fewer fermented foods than ever and fewer live ferments than ever like all the beer is like technically fermented but it's dead ferments you know and And we have, like, more health problems proliferating and, like, weird autoimmune diseases and gut issues. And, like, there's a lot to unpack in that conversation. But I can't help but believe that a part of that is, like, the lack of fermenting, you know? It's it's part of who we are. It's it's just part of our legacy as humanity, I think, is to ferment. And so I... I'm part of the cultural revival of fermentation <laughs> and the church of fermentation and the school of fermentation and the, the way of fermentation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it feels really important to me for our species to like reconnect with that art and to practice it. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see if you have any Gila bottles left just to see what's in them and yeah we can poke around I can definitely pull out my notebook which has everything that was put in there recorded in it um yeah I don't know if we'll find one but um 
Yeah. You can look at the list for sure. <laughs> and my, I say that because my cellar is just like such a mess. There's yeah, no there rhyme might or reason. Be a hard, uh... Even my labor labels are starting to fail after so many years of like, cause they sweat in there. And I didn't like waterproof labels or anything. They're just like printed on my printer or handwritten. So yeah, I'm, I'm starting to like realize that I'm, I was talking on the phone once with Turtle a long time ago and we came up with this idea that like from here on out we would start labeling one of every bottle, every batch that we made with the word funeral so that when we die there would just be this collection of like (laughs) all the meads we ever made in our favorite bottles so that at our funerals our friends could get toasted on everything we ever made. Oh my god. I know right? That's like the epic, epic layer, meta layer. And I, I just, I've realized, like, not all meads age well. After eight years, they've definitely peaked. And so I've started just pulling into that, like, the last ones. And I'm like, I don't know, facing cancer this year, I was like, man, I might die next year. I'm just going to drink this stuff. Like, <laughs> I, I'll share it with you, my friend. But I'm not, I'm no longer hoarding this giant stockpiled collection of old meads for some mythical time in the future. Because, shit, I might die a lot sooner than I realized and so it's been really fun to just like that was part of the three bottles I opened last weekend like Mm -hmm. I have one bottle of this red wine I made left I want to drink it you know or I have one bottle of Javota Kava mead that I made in Hawaii I want to drink it like fuck all you and my friends no (laughs) I'm not saving it for the funeral because and I know that seemed like a really good idea when my funeral felt really far away and Something about facing the immediacy of mortality puts a lot of things into perspective. Yeah. My grandpa died right before COVID hit. He was mm-hmm. 95, and I had made a meet on his 90th birthday oh. at the party. Oh. <laughs> and there's like muscadine grapes and mints and all kinds of random pears that a uh, pears from a pear tree that my great grandparents planted on the land that he grew up on and wow. like they were in season at the time and so wow this winter I drank I think the last that might be one bottle left but I was I drank while well, I was stuck at my parents place <laughs> <laughs> well I chose to put myself in that but I was like well mm-hmm. all these meads are stored here I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink this and think about my grandpa yeah that's part <laughs> of the specialness of it I made a mead with my grandfather who passed away in 2012 um out in California but he you know I was telling you before like his backyard was my joy my safe place my happy my happy place when I you know people talk about like where's your safe place where's your happy place I'm like oh it's in the fig tree in my grandpa's backyard and I remember uh one year I was traveling out there and it was when his his illness was progressing but he was still able to speak like towards the end of his life he kind of stopped speaking English and um, it was harder to communicate with him. He had Parkinson's. And um, I remember I had gone to this little reserve that I used to go to, and they had Mexican elderberries there, which are my favorite. They're, like, big and blue and velvety, and the plants are just, like, so abundant. And I filled, like, this big basket in, like, 20 minutes, no problem. And I brought it back, and then his grapes that he'd always grown with and was a home brewer with were going off. And so I harvested a bunch of grapes and made this, like, elderberry grape wine. And I thought I would be really cute and, like, have this experience with my grandpa. So I, like, cut my toenails and scrubbed my feet. And I was like, Grandpa, we're going to... And I remember my grandma wheeling him out because at this point he wasn't walking anymore. And I was like in the bucket with my feet. And he was like, no, nobody does that. What are you doing? That's gross. Get your feet out of the wine. Like that's just in the TV shows. I was like, really? (laughs) But he was like so touched and he was cracking up. And like he just thought it was so funny that it's like who he he used to call me the vagabond. Like because I would just like roll into my grandparents at like two o'clock in the morning unannounced and be like we'll sleep in the backyard don't like they would wake up sometimes they hadn't seen me for a year and a half and like me and my kids would be asleep in their backyard you know like I'm sorry I forgot to call I just I knew but they're of course like we're glad you're here they're so happy and they're instantly like Italian and feeding us and like come sleep inside we're like no we're good like under the grapefruit tree is the place to be and yeah I just remember the look in his eyes making that wine with me and 
Um, he lived long enough for me to go ahead and ferment that out and finish it and share a bottle with him, which was really, really nice. And yeah, there's one or two of those left in the cellar. One has the word funeral written on it, but I'm going to drink it. (laughs) But yeah, it's those moments, like what you described with your grandparent and like the way that we can utilize. And I, I think that's part of like the history of it too. Like sometimes in this community, folks reach out to me when they're getting married and ask me to make their wedding mead and like... It's just such an honor to do that for people and to, like, have dinner and and have them tell stories and capture their love while we're brewing this beverage that's going to then be served, like, a year later at their wedding, you know? And I always try to bottle, like, eight or ten of them that they just get to keep so that every so often at an anniversary or whatever it is, they they can open that and remember, you know, and like be transported to that. Or I had one person ask me to, (laughs) this is the most interesting request I think I've ever had was to make a mead during their birth. And yeah. And then we put like a tiny bit of placenta in it (laughs) and it's, it was delicious, but like, it was so intense to be like, are you sure you want me here? Like, well, you know, and I'm being a person who's birthed a few times, like, <laughs> I just kind of got it started, and like, you've never had a kid before, you don't know how weird this is going to get, and so like, I'm just going to keep it over here, and I'll be outside, they're like, yeah, thanks, you know, um, I also opened up like the pheromones of various people at that birth in the room with me, so I had like Siobhan's energy, because she's such a birth worker, and Yeah, it it gets weird, you know, like, when you start capturing essences of things and people and stuff, like, yeah, it gets really mystical fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I love it. Well, we're almost at two hours. Holy shit. Yeah. I'm almost finished the garlic. Is there anything, Mm. and I can tell that the evening is, yeah, yeah, feel it in the bugs and everything, but is there anything... I mean, I feel like that you have so many stories. It's been so amazing to listen to them and, and also connect to them pers- really personally. Yeah, we have similar trajectories yeah. in how we've chosen to walk on the planet. Yeah. Um, if there is any possible way you could have one last thing to say as we end this, do you have anything? Mm. Huh. Yeah, I, I guess my parting thought is just to get connected. I, I hope that this, whoever decides to listen to this rambling, feels connection through it. And I hope that it can inspire anyone to connect to the planet more or through through hiking or wandering or staying in place and growing food or plants or making medicine or making ferments like finding community whatever it is I just really hope for everyone to be connected um I feel so grateful profoundly grateful for the connection I feel to this planet um to the ancestors that were here we're in traditional Cherokee lands um and to the people who are drawn to this valley both the people I know and don't know um yeah I just I I feel so grateful and blessed to have the amount of connection in my life that I do and I I really wish that for everyone and so whoever's listening out there in Listenlandia um if you're not feeling connected change your life don't be afraid like do not just sit back and say oh maybe next year or maybe next time around, or whatever, I can grin and bear it, it's good enough, because shit sneaks up on you, like cancer, or car accidents, or old age, and it happens really fast, I can't believe I'm 45 years old at this point, like, oh, it's going quickly, um, so yeah, if you're not connected, and you're not happy, change your life, do something about it, and, uh, you know, seize the moment that you have to find joy. You just listened to a conversation with Marissa Prococa out of Barnardsville, North Carolina. To support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash of sedge and salt and become a monthly subscriber. You can also donate through PayPal or Venmo and the links to those ways are in the show notes. 
Also, any relevant links to this conversation are found in the show notes, including a link to the Firefly Gathering, which we talk about in this episode. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.